Our acclaimed national poet, Adam Lindsay Gordon, breathed many different airs in his lifetime, and from these tastings came the life he has shared with us from his pen. The smells of life are what the elephant's trunk senses, as a balance for the animal's poor eyesight, so they are aware of what is in the environment that surrounds them. Upon yonder rise there's a clump of trees, their shadows look cool and broad. You can crop the grass as fast as you please, while I stretch my limbs on the sward. Tis pleasant, I ween, with a leafy screen, oh the weary head to lie, on the mossy carpet of emerald green. Thus all alone by the wooden wold, I yield myself once again to the memories old that, like tales fresh told, come flitting across the brain. I have never been to the Azores where Gordon was born on the island of Fael, a name that has that exotic ring to it that reminds me of the aroma of a falafel shop, that multicultural flavour that nourishes many a lunchtime and late night journey in the cities and towns of Australia. Gordon's life fairly sizzled like the steak and sausages on a barbecue wherever he was residing. The smorgasbord of experience that was laid out for him even between sittings was further embellished with a fertile imagination and garnished with a plate of introduction. There is no doubt that the birthright of status gave admittance to a personal future that became a palindrome of what was planned or could even be presumed to be ordained for him. The physical disability, he was as blind as a bat, he couldn't see past the ears on his horse's head, that was the crux of curtailing a military career was overcome with the use of inherent talents. One being the use of what would be termed in the army initiative in the field. When applied to Gordon's life became free spirited. And therein lies the map to the path the poet's life rode. And right he did, not just in thought, but in deeds as well. I remember the lowering wintry morn and the mist on the Cotswold Hills, where once I heard the blast of the huntsman's horn, not far from the seven rills. Jack Esdale was there and Hugh St. Clair, Bob Chapman and Andrew Kerr, and Big George Griffiths on Devil May Care, and Black Tom Oliver, and one who rode on a dark brown steed, clean-jointed, sinewy spare, with the lean game head of the black lock breed, and the resolute eye that loves to lead, and the quarters massive and square, a tower of strength with a promise of speed, there was Celtic blood in the pair, I remember how merry a start we got when the red fox broke from the gorse. No word in reply his comrade spoke, nor wavered, nor once looked round. But I saw him shorten his horse's stroke as we splashed through the marshy ground. I remember the laugh that all the while on his quiet features played, so he rode to his death with that careless smile in the van of the light brigade. So stricken by Russian grape, the cheer rang out while he toppled back from the shattered lungs as merry and clear as it did when it roused the pack. Let never a tear his memory stain, give his ashes never a sigh, one of many who perished, not in vain, as a type of our chivalry. I remember one thrust he gave to his hat and two to the flanks of the brown, and still as a statue of old he sat and he shot to the front hands down. I remember the snort and the stag-like bound of the steed six lengths to the fore, and the laugh of the rider while, landing sound, he turned in his saddle and glanced around. I remember but little more, save a bird's eye gleam of the dashing stream, a jarring thud on the wall, a shock and the blank of a nightmare's dream. I was down with a stunning fall. Lindsay was the first Australian poet to be read by the ordinary man. H.M. Green in reviewing perhaps speaks for the reader of his poems when he wrote, we read Gordon not for his fine phrases, but for the directness of some cry, and above all for the breadth and effectiveness of any utterance taken as a whole. And we read him because even if we ourselves are not hunters, sportsmen, soldiers, adventurers, he uncovers some underlying stratum of such men in us, opening up to us the road of adventure and blowing over it the wind of romance. His sometimes naive, sometimes ironic comments on life may be largely the result of early experience. Gordon's poems are predominantly poetry of action and human passion. 
They contain the first stirrings of a national school of Australian poetry recognised by his writing poems in the first instance and in the creation of the Australian ballad, followed by Banjo Patterson, Lawson and others. Ah, friend, did you think when the London sank, timber by timber, plank by plank, in a cauldron of boiling surf, how alone at least, with never a flinch, in a rally contested inch by inch, you could fall on the trampled turf. When a livid wall of the sea leaps high in the lurid light of a leaden sky and bursts on the quarter railing, while the howling storm gust seems to vie with the crash of splintered beams that fly, yet fails too oft to smother the cry of women and children wailing. Then those who listen in sinking ships to the despairing sobs of their loved ones' lips, where the green wave thus slowly shatters, may long for the crescent claw that rips the bison into ribbons and strips and tears strong elk to tatters. O oh, sundering short of body and breath, O oh, battle and murder and sudden death, against which the liturgy preaches, by will of a just yet merciful power, less bitter perchance in the mystic hour, when the wings of the shadowy angel lower, the man in his blindness teaches. A global traveller, Gordon had no access to Qantas. His voyages were by sailing ship across oceans. And as we all know, travelling can be dangerous no matter what the mode of transport is used, even today. But the option of letting fears overcome progress is not a consideration, and the majority of people accept these risks with the knowledge of the environment that they are going to, to keep them safe. But it takes bravery to venture to a new location without any knowledge, to prepare yourself or wend your way through the hazards that exist for the unwary. I remember some words my father said when I was an urchin vain. God rest his soul in his narrow bed these ten long years he has lain. When I think one drop of the bloody bore, this faint heart must surely hold. It may be my fancy and nothing more, but the faint heart seemeth bold.